Convincing Family and Strangers to DNA Test, the Why and How of It. For this agenda, we need to look at the reasons for wanting additional testers, as well as the various steps to convince family and public to test. First of all, you need to gather as much information as you can. For the Y DNA test, know all males that descend directly from your oldest proven ancestor of your all-male line. For mitochondria DNA, know all females that descend directly from your maternal all-female line. For autosomal DNA, know all descendants from as many of your 64 fourth great-grandparents for which you have names. If you can take the uh, lineage back a couple more generations, that's even better. So why do you need to test? For Y chromosome testers, perhaps you have a few or no matches. Perhaps your matches, you have many but no paper trail to connect them. Perhaps you match various surnames even on the Y67 and Y111. And it's possible that you match surnames that are not yours and you match nothing of your surname. For the mitochondria test, you may be trying to get through brick walls. For autosomal DNA testing, you can't find the common ancestor. And if you're adopted, it's important to test anyone that you know is connected to your family. So let's look at some of the problems to help the Y DNA tester, the all-male line. If you have few or no matches, interview any living relatives for clues. Locate friends of your relatives as they may have clues. Research the last known areas where your ancestors lived, exhausting all records, including newspapers. Bring down an all-female line from someone you maybe find in this area to the present and ask them to test. Of course, you may have to pay for that test. In this case, Bill, Joel, and Arlen all have perfect matches and wonderful pedigrees that go back to John. Descendants of John's son, Henry, have not tested as yet. Curtis has tested, but he can only take his uh, lineage back to Peyton, although he has a perfect match with the others on a Y37. So what's Curtis to do? He needs to narrow his hunt. Have all testers upgrade to the Y111 to see if the exact match prevails. If Curtis and another tester end up with the same mutation at the Y111, those two lines are more closely related with each other than they are with the entire group. Curtis should then focus his research on the line that has the same mutation at the Y111 level. Possible solutions could include that there are no mutational differences with all who upgrade. In that case, test the descendant of John's other children to rule them in or out, as you saw Henry on the chart. If all tests are a perfect match, Curtis must revert to genealogy, carefully researching the time and place where any of the descendants of John and his Peyton lived. Sometimes you can uh, solve problems through triangulation. If you cannot find the common ancestor with your match, determine where the genetic difference happened through triangulating. This can require testing along the all-male lines of both you and the match. Dan has a genetic difference with Jim. Dan's paper trail descends from Abraham through his son Frederick. Jim's paper trail descends from Henry through his son, Andrew. Dan matches other testers, including Arlen, and another son of Abraham not shown here. Regardless, Jim and Dan have a genetic difference or mutation that needs to be reconciled. Their DNA indicates they have a common ancestor according to the number of markers tested and their paper trails appear very solid. Jim must test another male from his oldest generation, Henry, to see if his genetic difference is somewhere along his line. He tests a descendant of Henry's son, Paige, named Sam. 
Sam match the descendants of Abraham. So the mutation is not with Paige's line. Now Jim must test another son of Andrew to see if Andrew received a mutation from Father Henry. Jim tests Carl, a descendant of Andrew's son William. If Carl, the descendant of William, matches Paige, then Jim received the mutation somewhere along his line between himself and Peter, or perhaps Andy. It could even be that Jim or Jim's father, Jim should continue testing to discover who first received the mutation. If Carl matches Jim, then Andrew received the mutation from his father's line. And as you can see, Carl did match Jim. And therefore, Andy was given the mutational difference from his father, Henry. We know from reliable genealogical records that Abraham and Henry were brothers. Jim and Carl matched, so the lineage back to John is correct. Perhaps you match various surnames. My cousin Doug Doolin, who allowed his name to be used here, had a thousand perfect Y12 matches with multiple surnames. And some of these common surnames were before written records. The surname matched only when testing a male from the same distant ancestors. So on the Y37, he matches another person from James Doolin, who was in Virginia and Kentucky. The y snip test, however, that we did indicated Doolins were originally Dowlings from the mid-1600s in County Leash, Ireland. Many of his matches names were there as well, and they are considered now the seven steps of Leash. Prior to this, we didn't know where in Ireland our ancestors came, but now we have a bit of a focus in the mid-1600s. My Doolin line came to Virginia in the mid-1700s, so it has narrowed the time frame. Perhaps you match other surnames, and this could be what is called an NPE, originally uh, a non-parental event. However, I don't like using that. It's not accurate. I say not the parent expected. And it means that one dominant name exists and that is possibly a sign of a, an adoption or a name change somewhere in the lineage for various reasons, not necessarily illegitimacy. In that case, you need to test all male lines of the oldest known ancestor that differ from your son of that ancestor and continue testing each generation along the different sons until the generation with the name change is found. For mitochondria DNA, we have fewer problems, but they're generally all the same. And that is getting through a brick wall. You need to interview any living relatives for clues and locate friends of your relatives as they may have clues, especially if your brick wall is fairly recent. Research the last known areas where your ancestors live, exhausting all records again, even the newspapers. Bring down an all-female line of someone you may find in those areas to the present and test the woman. For autosomal DNA testing, it can be anywhere on your pedigree chart back at least six generations. So you need to locate all the ancestors, even perhaps back to 12 generations, in the case that there is some endogamy in your line, that is, cousins, um, married cousins. Test your second and third cousins to separate pedigree chart. Compare your known cousins with unknown cousins. Determine the half-identical regions of your match. This is how you find the common ancestors, the most simplest way. Compare the appropriate section of your lineage at that point. So let's look at testing known cousins. This is my pedigree chart and I tested my first cousin, Doug, on my paternal line. He matches me at our grandparents, Guy and Georgia. And if I match another person 
as well as Doug, and Doug matches this other person, I know it's on my father's all male or my father's line. And that cut my hunt down in half. That's how we separate the pedigree chart. But you can further separate. I tested Dan, a second cousin once removed. And we match with Ben and Tina. In my family, it's Tina, and it's not an abbreviation of Christina. If Dan and I, or Dan and Doug and I, all match another unknown person, and each person matches each person, then I know to look along the lines of Benjamin and Tina and further back. That divided my pedigree chart a bit more. Then I tested and um, descendants from my mother's line. Gerald, in my family, Gerald, not Gerald, and uh, if we match someone, I look at John and Ervilla's line, and then Robert on Lowry and Mary's line. This divided my pedigree chart up into smaller pieces. However, um, I do not have to use all males. I just happen to. It could be females, that the cousins that are tested. If you're adopted, contact dnaadoption.com. They provide free help, a wonderful service, and guidance is all free. Test all three companies for the autosomal DNA and watch for first or second cousins to appear. That would be great clues. Test the mitochondria and the Y if a biological parent is known um, on that line is not known. So you want to test, if you're a male, test your Y. If you're a female, test your mitochondria. If you have one living parent, test that person as well. Test um, and search for reliable candidates to test where your family lived or where you were adopted, if possible. Now, to begin with convincing people to test. It's not always begging. <laughs> um, there are no guarantees of success, however, and practice does make perfect. Doing nothing gains nothing. Every relative you can convince to test will help you with your unknown matches. Convincing a stranger to test who may help your brick wall is being proactive. Otherwise, you can sit and wait. Before calling potential testers, you need to understand some basics of DNA testing. You need to know which companies offer what, including the type of kits, fit or buccal, um, because older generations sometimes have a problem with spit tests, be prepared to explain the different tests. Do not misinterpret DNA testing. Be sincere, be yourself, and not over-enthusiastic or pushy. Before you call, know a few generations of the potential tester's lineage, three or more. Expect to spend much time on the phone and to call more than once. Be interested in what the person is saying as they may wish to share their family knowledge. Speak clearly and not quickly. Ask if it's a good time to call. Do not interrupt a ball game, TV show, a meal, or time with children. Be interested in the person's occupation or advocation. Be aware the person you call may be from another ethnic group, but still could be related and willing to test. Be courteous to the person who is ill or in the middle of a project. Ask when to call back. Do not bore your potential tester with genealogical stories of your family. Genealogists have a tendency to do that. And most important, you need to alleviate the fears of the person you're contacting. Some people are very fearful of scams. Uh, they have worries about privacy and testing. There is the justice system and medical and employment concerns. Um, and the results of the company being shared with perhaps, you know, drug industries, whatever. Financial concerns can also be an issue. But the basic issues to cover when you call are to introduce yourself as a genealogist. 
and mention the relevant surname. Ask the person if he or she is related to the ancestors you believe to be their grandparents or the great grandparents. Do not mention the parent's information. That's a little close to home and can be very scary for people that you've discovered that. The basic issues to cover would suggest there would be a relationship between your lineage and theirs, but that the paper trail is missing, and that's what you wish to find. Ask the person if they know the connection. Ask if there is a family genealogist, because you want that person on your side, and sometimes it's easier to explain all this to a genealogist. Offer to send a copy of their lineage if they are interested. Use the U.S. mail so you have their addresses unless they insist otherwise. Obtain leads on their family and on contacting their relatives as another person may be more willing to test. So you might politely ask if they have an uncle or some other person who would be interested in the genealogy. Thank the person for his time, or her time, and their interest in helping. Ask if you can call again when you need to follow up and when you need to find out more information on the family. Refrain from discussing DNA initially. Find the paper trail that you will need later. That is the most important. Speak to the family genealogist before you mention DNA to your potential tester. You may have to explain DNA and convince that genealogist how testing can help show you are related. Not all genealogists deal with DNA. Be prepared to have several conversations. Let the potential tester know that since no one can find the paper trail connecting the families, there is one other way you know. DNA. Offer to pay for the test. Sometimes your or their family members may split the cost, however. Remember, the goal is to educate the potential tester and to alleviate his or her concerns. When it comes to convincing people to test, practice makes perfect. No one will be 100% successful, so plan to contact more than one person for the test. In summary, understand all you can about DNA. Locate multiple te potential testers and know some of their lineage. Initially, discuss only genealogy. Educate the potential tester on DNA. Success does improve with practice. Questions?